just like with the 4R model. You can use the 4D model in reverse when you're doing your retrospective and your review. If what you delivered didn't match what the product owner and the stakeholders were looking for, then you're going to have to go back and look at the delivery and look at your distilled agreement. What did we agree to in the sprint backlog during the sprint planning? And then ultimately go back to and look at what were our definitions. Now, when we think one level up, like program level, <clears throat> and you've driven through multiple iterations, you notice on this slide, I included a little extra explosion there because without fail, I haven't seen a traditional classic waterfall or lean agile scrum team effort that hasn't experienced the following. And that's somewhere along the way. And in one of these projects, uh, we were, uh, you know, chugging along. And it, it probably took three, four months before one of the stakeholders said, well, hey, wait a minute. If we continue doing this, we'll only get this level of savings, and it's not enough to even pay for the investments that we're going to be doing. You're going to hit a point. <coughs> not sure where that's at. It depends on the length and complexity of the project. But without exception, between deliver and drive, there's this little explosion where somebody says, oh, by the way, Without fail, I've, I've never seen a traditional Gantt chart from the beginning of a project ever match the Gantt chart at the end. And it's the same for the program plans and for the product roadmaps and the program roadmaps, same thing. Along the way, these little explosions will happen. And when that happens, the minute you hear somebody saying, oh, by the way, we have this one small change. By definition, you have a new project or work effort underway because when that happens, that means that we missed a, an agreement on what we were distilling to deliver. So that means by definition, we have a new definition because, oh, by the way, is a new definition. I had an executive come to me and say, Andrew, I need to do this one small change. And I said, okay, great. Let me take that back to the team. Let's look at the, at the plan and let me show you what this one small change is gonna cost you. Can you give me a day or two to put together the numbers? And the CEO went, yeah, sure, this, uh, that sounds great. Come back to me with how much the change is gonna cost me. Two days later, I see him and I say, well, uh, we, we ran the numbers. Here's what you have to give up. And here's what this additional small little change will cost you. It's 1.2 million euros. Uh, would you like me to make the adjustment to the plan? The CEO's eyes, he just got huge. I remember the look on his face to this day because this is almost 20 years ago. And he goes, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> now that we, we actually don't need that change. I said, oh, okay. Well, so you want us to continue with the plan with what we're going to implement, how it's going to be implemented. He goes, well, yeah, because if I have to give up these other things, this small change, it's not a higher priority than what we're already doing. I wanted that small change in addition to what you're already doing. And I looked at him and I said, and with what small army were we going to do that with? And with a smile. And he started chuckling and goes, okay, you got me on that one. <laughs> and so... Whenever I hear an, oh, by the way, we've got this one small change, almost without exception, there's no such thing as a small change. And we need to be able to help the executives understand the economic trade-off, the economic cost for, okay, if you want that small change, it's going to cost you either in less features over here and or this additional amount of investment that you're going to have to make. Nine times out of ten, the, the, the executive's going to look at that and they're going to go, well, you know what, that's not as high as priority as we thought, 
table that, go forward with what you're doing. Uh, let's not derail the team with the momentum that they already have. So the CEO was wise enough to do that. And so that's an example of, again, using the 4D model in reverse to help them understand that if you're creating new definitions, then uh, your little explosion up there on the left-hand side between deliver and drive, yeah, it's an explosion, but that doesn't mean that it should necessarily be done or invested in. Again, <clears throat> as with the 4R model, uh, Logos, Ethos, Pathos, Rema are very similar ideas. It's the talk and the walk. And Logos are your definitions, your words. Ethos are your ethics that you're distilling. Uh, hopefully your team is able to deliver and to deliver it with passion. And as you're doing that and driving the results, it comes to life. And that's how you speak life into a team. That's how you breathe life into the team. And the rhema, the word in action, should be a manifestation of the vision that you're trying to achieve. It's, uh, it's almost like trying to give birth to a baby or something like that. Okay, And so the vision of what you want the team to, the, to deliver in the future, what you want them to be, the rhema should be the living manifestation of your vision. And that isn't something that's always intuitively obvious to team leaders, team members, team facilitators, product owners, scrum masters, agile coaches, enterprise agile coaches, and... <clears throat> If you want to be able to handle politics and handle changes and, and help people transform, you cannot transform an organization unless you start transforming the way that they speak and communicate to each other. And until they start using the words, until they start uh, speaking to each other in new ways until they start sp speaking life into the teams and breathing life into the teams, you're just going to have business as usual. You can, you can put the lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You can, you can try to, to, to do agile or, or to do flow. But the reality is, is you're only going to be going through the motions. It's not going to have any fundamental change. It's not going to transform how the person thinks. It's not going to give them the right mindset. And it's definitely uh, not going to help them to be agile or to achieve a state of sustainable flow. Okay? So, uh, just like with the 4R model, with the 4D model, at the team level, you still have the idea of definitions, ethics, passion, and making it all come to life so that those definitions come to life and fulfill the vision that you're trying to achieve. A very elegant way that one of our Agile coaches um, <clears throat> was able to describe how to use the 4D model, but a slightly different way. In many organizations, the executives, they'll just inform the team members and their direct reports. They'll inform them and expect action. And you really need to break this inform act, I'll call it an anti-pattern for lack of a better word. Um, it's really something that works against you. And I don't know why the executives do that. They, they inform, they issue their edicts, and they expect action. Now, that's great. But there's a whole alternate path. If you want action, and if you want to find a way to increase real conversations and the value add of those real conversations, 
And if you really want the teams to commit to delivering what it is you want them to deliver that's included in the sprint goals and product backlog items and everything that's included in the sprint, here's what's got to happen. And many thanks to Bob Geist, a Flow Certified Professional Agile Coach, for um, distilling and drawing this picture. It was just brilliant. Um, <clears throat> Instead of going straight from in, inform to expecting action, the executives need to understand that first, do I have understanding? Okay, are my definitions to the team clear? And if they've understood what I've communicated, do they agree with it? Okay, so that's um, distill agreement. Okay. Another distillation that has to happen after that is getting the commitment. And that's when the whatever level that you're working at, whether it's a portfolio or program or project or whatever, where you get the commitment is, okay, we're going to commit the people, we're going to commit the budget, and we're actually going to go deliver this. Without that commitment, they can inform and expect action all day. But if where the rubber hits the road, and in most companies that are big, that have monolithic bureaucracies, if I don't have the resources, if I don't have the people, and if I don't have the budget, you can inform me all day, but I'm not going to be able to act. It's that simple. And so if you're dealing with a large organization, this is a beautiful application of distill, deliver, of def definition, distill, and deliver. And then <clears throat> drive would be the iterative loop coming back and double checking with the executive. Here's what you informed us. Here was the actions. Are you still in alignment with what we just did? So it, this is a really cool application of the 4D model in a real life project situation where we were repeatedly running into this information act anti-pattern that was really messing up the team, the team members, the program managers, the uh, managers who were in charge of allocating resources and budget. And so once we started walking our stakeholders through this, they went, oh, yeah, there are additional steps. We we're trying to help them break that bad habit. In this next section, we're going to get into roles, teams, and leadership, and somewhat trying to align agile scrum roles with typical organizational roles along with the leadership teams and uh, sort of try to divvy up who's doing what. <clears throat> in this picture, I use the uh, four box that we use in the transformation slide deck e extensively and we use it in this deck as well quite a bit. And you have the four different boxes, <clears throat> the individual team, product, and organization boxes. Scrum roles shouldn't be confused with your title in the organization. Theoretically, a CEO could also be a product owner. Okay. Uh, a <clears throat> program manager could also end up being a scrum master. So depending on the situation and depending on the need, the roles that you have doing agile or scrum are <coughs> pretty well delineated. In scrum, there are only three roles. There's the product owner, the scrum master or team level facilitator, and then the developers. So those are the three key roles in Scrum. And in this picture, they're all the ones in green. Now, 
The green dot in the middle primarily represents the scrum master, a little bit the product owner, but primarily the scrum master, in that a scrum master should be able to work and work in and work with all four of these areas. Scrum masters need to work with the team members individually, the teams as a team, the product owners, as well as a little bit with the organization in helping to coach the organization on best agile practices. Now, where it gets starts to get a little messy is when I've added in the yellow circle. <clears throat> and I've tried to do these circles in such a way so that, for example, the yellow circle really touches three of the boxes. So an agile coach is not a scrum master, but an agile coach should do everything and can do everything that a scrum master would do. And <clears throat> basically, uh, it's building on the competence of a scrum master or team level facilitator. So the agile coach is going to work more with the product owners with the uh, as well as the scrum masters and the agile coaches are going to also work with the enterprise agile coaches who work who are that outer blue circle that work primarily on the right hand side. As I've stressed throughout this video series Product includes programs, processes. It will inc include people like the program managers, the line managers, business owners, uh, product managers, all kinds of managers will be sitting in this upper right hand corner. And this is where this corner gets a little fuzzy because if you remember the different languages, this box speaks both the language of management and the language of leadership, which is the lower right corner. The enterprise agile coach does everything that an agile coach and a scrum master can do, plus they work primarily with portfolio level and up, working with the senior and executive management and the C-level, helping them understand what it is that they need to do in order to enable <clears throat> and to create the culture that will enable the teams that are trying to use agile and high-speed methodologies and things like that, they need to build the culture that's going to enable that. They need to build the culture that's going to create protected environments for those teams. They need to build the culture that values the team feedback. They want to build a culture where the teams are able to freely and openly discuss with the leadership what it is that they're trying to achieve. So it's both bottom-up and top-down at the same time. 